Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Eccentric, the makers of the K-Box and the new K-Pulley. Guys, flywheel training's really grown in popularity of late, and although it's something that's been around for a while, the simple reason that it's grown in popularity is because it works. We've been lucky to have a K-Box in our weight room for the past three years, and we've seen some really great things when it comes to improving the athlete's ability to change direction, and then looking at our return to play protocols with different lower body injuries with the student athletes. The love-hate relationship that everyone has with the K-Box is now just going to grow more with the addition of the K-Pulley. The ability to do standing presses, pulls, rip-throughs, and knee drive exercises is just going to be another arsenal to our training and another addition to the love-hate relationship that our student-athletes have with the awesome tools that come from Eccentric. Go ahead and hop over to Eccentric.com today to check out what they have. Guys, I can't recommend it enough, and I guarantee you won't be disappointed not just with the products, but with the awesome customer service that Eccentric provides. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content that it provides, make sure you hop over and check out the all-new Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is the combination of the CVA SPS community and the Rugby Strength Coach community, bringing you what is sure to be the Internet's leading resource for continuing education for strength and conditioning professionals. Combining these two resources has allowed us to bring some of the best content from some of the best minds in the world together for your one-stop shop to better improve the continuing education for not just yourself, but your entire staff. Bringing together all of the lectures from the Rugby Strength Coach community, along with the lectures exclusively done for the Central Virginia Sport Performance community, and all the lectures performed at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar, make this an absolute must for performance coaches around the world. The world-class lectures at the Strength Coach Network are not all that you'll see as well. The discussion in the forums and the support and the career guidance from some of the top practitioners in the world, from people all over the world, makes this an absolute must and a great place for you to network, learn, and grow as a performance professional. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS, that's C-V-A-S-P-S, to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. We're sure you're going to find great value in the Strength Coach Network and are really excited to have you involved. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS to check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an absolutely killer discussion with the University of Denver's Gary Boros uh, getting right into talking about the meat and potatoes of training. Guys, Gary's going to give us a little rundown of how we got down there to Denver and then Really, we're just going to dive right into it. Gary's going to break down where he's at in his four seasons with his teams, how his approach has been developed, where these ideas have come from, and his little, you know, kind of twists and turns that he's made to the programming based on the, the great mentors that he's had on his way to Denver. This is really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Gary, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Ah, uh, Jade, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor and a privilege. Well, listen, man, I'm stoked to get this down. I'm, I'm happy we can make this work here. And uh, let you know, for the the person, maybe person and a half who doesn't know who you are and how you got down to Denver, let's uh, let's give them the Spark Notes version of you know who you are, where you're at, and and what got you there. Yeah, so I am right now serving as the associate director of sports performance at the University of Denver, and just about wrapping up my my third year here, and kind of how I got to this spot. So the journey for me really started uh, was a collegiate athlete, um, born and raised in Minnesota, played some college hockey, got hurt, and then had to make a big life decision. All right, what do I want to do with my life? Um, had always loved the training aspect of of things, and. and uh, transferred over to the University of Minnesota, and that's when I got in touch with um, Cal Dietz and Sarah Wiley, uh, did an internship through them, um, got my bachelor's degree from the University of Minnesota. Um, there, the doors just kept opening and opening. Went on and got a um, master's degree from St. Cloud State University, worked as a graduate assistant, strength and conditioning coach at St. Cloud State. Um, and then again, more doors just just kept opening. So once I once I finished at St. Cloud, I was able to become the uh, the only strength coach, uh, the director, if you will, at Bemidji State University, where I had to oversee 14 teams at one time, which I had no help, no assistance, nothing. And I was there for three years and just using my network was able to to land the position here in Denver. <clears throat> 
sensational. I love it. And, you know, the thing that I think that's really interesting to me is now you're in Denver, but a hockey guy with a hockey yes. background who yes. works in hockey schools yes. <laughs> is no longer working with hockey. So let's yeah. talk about what you got rolling, you know, down there in Denver now. Yeah. So uh, currently oversee four teams here at the University of Denver. Uh, women's soccer would be the fall sport. Uh, the winter sports would be both men's and women's basketball. And then the spring sport would be women's lacrosse. So again, you've got, you know, different phases of those teams all over the place. So again, we'll, we'll start with the fall sport with, with women's soccer. So they're right now currently going through an accumulation phase. You know, we just got them back with, with being on the quarter system here at Denver. They get a six week break at, at Thanksgiving, you know, so they get a pretty extensive period where they're off. They come back and then we've got to start to ramp back up. We've got to start, uh, you know, putting some stress on them, getting ready for their spring schedule. So that's right where we're at. And we're, we've, we've gone through the, the GPP phase with them and we're just starting into our uh, eccentric block with them for triphasic. Um, with basketballs, again, March Madness being right around the corner, we're entering right into our peaking phases there. So really the volume, uh, again, becomes becomes a factor with, you know, you, you want to make sure you take into consideration where are they at, what are they going through practice wise. And so we're still getting in there. You know, we've never not trained in season. You know, there's there's some programs, some teams that will back off, but we will not. You know, I've got, you know, the the trust and the good rapport with my basketball coaches where they want the kids in there. They want them to keep training. And so, um, yes, we're still going, but we're just really reducing volume with their their training stress right now. Um, and then with women's lacrosse, this will be their uh, entering into their third week of their season. Um, and again, we just finished uh, going through their peaking phase. And so now we're just touching up on some of the re the residuals that we've hit in the off season with them to keep them firing on all cylinders. I love it, man. And I, you know what I, I love the most about it is, is how – a, that's such a wide variety of types of athletes. And yeah. B, it's so different than what your background was that got you there. Sure. Absolutely. You know, and for me, it was, it was a deal. I'll be honest. When I came and started working with, with lacrosse, for example, I'll be honest, I didn't know much about the sport. So I had to really spend a lot of time being at practice, being out there, seeing, okay, what are the, what are the specific needs of these athletes? You know, what are the, the demands? And so from just being there, I think it kind of killed two birds with one stone. It was able to teach me about what do they actually need, but then it, it just showed them, oh, hey, he's not just a face that we see in the weight room every day. He's out there at practice. He's out there at a warm up, at a, at a cooling session. So for me, it was important to just build trust, you know, with these athletes first and show them that that you care. You know, that that workout card means nothing if they don't know that you truly care about them. And so for me, it was kind of doing two things at once. <clears throat> I love it. So now, well, being out of practice at Denver, depending on the time of year, that can be a challenge in and of itself, too. I mean, Big not time. for a Minnesota guy, but like, you know, <laughs> I've lived in the South for too long. I don't know if I can handle that anymore. <laughs> yeah, there's some days there where like today we got, it was a little bit chilly out there, but you know, we gotta, we gotta still get out there. We gotta go to practice. Um, so there are some days when it's a little, a little bit more, uh, more challenging than others. So, <clears throat> so now it, let's talk a little bit about how these things have come together. So you're talking about, you have an accumulation block going right now with soccer and you're talking about your triphasic model with others. And a lot of that is going to really run down the the, the Caldeets, you know, uh, rabbit hole. So sure, let's, sure. let's talk about how this has kind of evolved and what you've taken from your time at the University of Minnesota. And then what what sort of, I don't know how we'd say this, like Gary Flair have you yeah. put on these things? Because, you know, there's always going to be everybody's own little, you know, extra mix to the soup, if you may. Sure, sure. I would say early, early in my career, you know, it, it, a lot of stuff is just going through of what you see and then giving the athlete, what do they actually need? I made the mistake early on in my career of, you know, maybe thinking, okay, the athlete, we're going to put them in, we're going to, we're going to throw this training protocol at them when they necessarily didn't need that, you know? So that's the mistake that I made early on. So it was really figuring out, okay, well, if, if, if you have an athlete who, is again, as, as, as weak as it comes and has never, you know, touched a weight in their life. Well, almost anything is going to work for them. But if you've got a, a higher advanced athlete, you've got to be a little bit more selective with where you're actually at. So coming through and actually seeing, you know, some of the stuff at, at Minnesota, you know, watching the, the stress methods, taking little pieces of that really just helped me form. Okay. This is really 
what athlete this this is how I need to actually stress each athlete moving forward. And so again, it's just taking a look at, you know, let's take basketball, for example, and you know this, you know, working with basketball down there is at the end of the day, if they can't move, they're no good to us. And it's a it's a huge lateral based sport. And so we've got to be able to move, you know, not only laterally, uh, you know, frontal plane sagittal, but also transverse. And so the thing that that I took with it is okay, yes, we need to stress them, but at the end of the day, they have to be able to move. You know, and so that's really the the big part that I've taken with a lot of my teams is, OK, yes, we need to stress in the weight room, but we got to get you to move. and We got to get you to move efficiently and effectively. So then how do you tie that in? Because a lot of people would look at it. And I think that a lot of people make the. What's the word? The uneducated guess as to looking at triphasic is only. Mm-hmm. that strength related type system. So how, sure. do, how do you manipulate things and how do you implant those movement skills throughout your training protocol then? Yeah, sure. So really what we do is let, let's take uh in season, let's take, uh, you know, could be, let's take women's across, for example. So what we're doing right now is, is I call it more of a mix or a hybrid in season. So again, we're still going back hitting some of the uh, uh, muscle actions. They're actually going through some eccentric work right now. That's always going to stay the same for your major movement, whatever, whatever you might have could be squat, deadlift, you know, unilateral. But then once we start to get down, we call it a hybrid because it's actually a mixture of almost a a tier setup where you're starting to get into, you know, you've got your, your plyo and your speed, but then you've got a little bit of, of volume work towards the end. So those assistance exercises are really where we build in kind of our 3d training model. We'll take a normal um, sagittal lunge and we'll just do it in all three planes of motion, whether it be, we call it here, just a a dumbbell common lunge matrix where, yeah, you're doing maybe two or three reps going sagittal. Then you take it and you go frontal plane, then you do it in row in the rotational plane. So we're just always touching up on that. Now, do we consistently go overboard with that? Absolutely not because they're seeing so much of that in their sport in season already. We're just touching up on it where we don't have to hammer home those make those three planes of motion as we're going through it. I love it. I love it. So then now when we're going back through and we're talking about, you know, the, the idea of these progressions and the stresses, how then are you looking at these kids through their training age or preparation level or whatever, whatever it may be as to how you're progressing and moving forward? So right when they get in, they basically, we start almost everyone, if it's a freshman or if, a, if it's a transfer really right at our block zero. And then it's really just looking at, okay, this is how well they can actually move going through some assessments, you know, taking a look at joint ranges of motion, you know, our basketball players, we, you know, this as well as I do, you know, their ankle dorsiflexion is going to be extremely poor. You know, a lot of times with our males, uh, hip internal external rotation is going to be poor. So at the end of the day, taking a look at, all right, where are they, where are they not good at and, and actually building off of there with that, we actually will structure individual individualized warmups for our players based on some of those screens that we actually have. Then again, taking a look at the training age and seeing, okay, does this kid need to get stronger or is this kid as strong as it comes? And we got to focus on a little bit more speed strength, if you will, or some power work. So that's where the program starts to get individualized may have the same major movements in a given workout. We're just chasing a different parameter or a different ability, if you will. Sensational. So like, Can we dive down that rabbit hole a little bit more if possible? Just because I think that the one thing that a lot of people, a lot of people, I definitely do. And I think (laughs) that a lot of other people kind of get caught with is how we can do better with individualizing each aspect of the program based on whatever Mm -hmm. assessment we may be using. Yeah. So let, let's let's back up a little bit. So I have uh, an extremely awesome relationship with the athletic trainers that I work with. And so everything that, you know, again, when we do that initial assessment, what we're looking at, again, joint ranges of motion between the respective sport athletic trainer and myself, that's where we will build an individualized workout or excuse me, a warm up protocol for that specific person. Then once we get in, let's say we get into um, going through the actual workout protocol, we may have, let's take, for example, I've got one of my seniors right now. I mean, strong as an ox, strong as it comes, but his focus, he doesn't need to get any stronger. I mean, he's a, he could easily squat 400 pounds on a back squat. Do I need a basketball player to do more than that? Probably not because is the risk worth the reward? Absolutely not. So with him, 
being as strong as it comes, we're doing a lot of VBT training with him. You know, we're fortunate enough to have the, the gym aware system here and just to go through and just really focus on a little bit more speed strength. Now, comparing the same, you know, major movement, as I said previously, to one of our freshmen who's as, as weak as a kitten or as weak as it comes, well, that kid just needs to get stronger. So, again, we still have to take into consideration volume, but we got to get that kid strong because it, the ability to produce force – you know, if you can't, if you're not strong and you don't have it, the rate of force development is going to be hard to come by. <clears throat> I love it. So then as you move forward and these things get into the end season, mm-hmm. how does that impact that time of the year? Because, you know, as sure. much as we love the, the off season work and all that stuff, the bread and butter really comes with the W's and the L's. Big time, big time. So when we get into the end season, we have, and again, you know, as well as I do, to, to train in season is always a little bit of a challenge. You got to get creative. You got to get the session in where you can actually get it in. So again, taking into consideration the the volume of, of practice that they're under. And again, we're constantly watching. All right. Is this, is this a high minute volume player or is this someone who plays less than half a game or really doesn't play much at all? And then it's giving the autonomy to some of those kids who have high volume minutes to say, all right, this is what we got going on today. Hey, if, if you don't feel like you got it because you're playing so many minutes, I'm obviously going to reduce the stress. You may only come in. We might hit one or two sets. You're doing some regen protocol and you're out the door because you are gassed and you're smoked right now just from playing so many minutes. If it's, a, like I said, an, an athlete, basketball player who's playing less than half the game or not much at all, then we've got to keep going after you because we got to keep giving you stress and stimulus to keep ramping you up. Otherwise, we're never going to really get anywhere. So for me, it's just having great conversations with uh, the coaching staffs that I work with. And, you know, I'm fortunate they've got the, the utmost trust in what we do down here in the weight room and just keeping open ended conversations, not only with the coaching staff, but with the athlete themselves and checking in on them and saying, you know, how you feeling today? You know, and if you don't got it and you're a high minute player, I'm not going to make you go through that because now I'm just pouring salt on an open wound. <clears throat> You know, and I think more and more of the better coaches that you get to talk to are really leaning more and more towards that autonomy Mm -hmm. to the student athlete. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I just want to give them because at the end of the day, you know, yes, we have to get them to be better athletes. That's obviously what we're after. So in season, do I care if the kid, you know, ramps up the bar and, and hits a major PR? No, not necessarily, because if it doesn't transfer to what they're doing out on the on the court, then again, are we are we giving them something that they don't necessarily need? And again, if they're a high minute player, we got to make sure that we're not crushing these guys in season, because, again, we could be it's all at the end of the day. It's all about how many how, how successful are you making the program and are you helping aid in getting them wins and obviously staying out of that loss column? And again, it's it's all about them. It's, it's not about us as a strength and conditioning coach. It's about them and what do they need and having us guide and help them through the process. So then looking at those things, you know, it's been a pretty crazy voyage for you going from your time as an athlete to your time at the University of Minnesota to your time at as a, as a loan director. Yeah. And yeah. then now here. So yeah. what are some things you've brought along the way in those three tiers of the director pyramid, if you may, Yeah. that yeah. are impacting how you're developing relationships within the department now. Yeah. So I think no matter what communication is, is going to be number one. And so even starting from just working with the people around you, you know, we've got a a great system here at the university of Denver and that being, you know, pioneer health and performance where there are several hats that fall under that umbrella. So uh, we've got everything from athletic training to um, registered dietitians to sports psychologists, to ourselves, the coaching staff, and then last, but certainly not least the student athletes. So being able to communicate. And that's one thing I learned early on is you got to communicate with all of these people around you, because at the end of the day, it's all of us using a holistic approach to give that student athlete, whatever advice that they may need from lifestyle management, help with their nutritional habits, their sleeping patterns. Um, and, and again, just everything in here, in the weight room, recovery modalities, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the big part for me. And then just being able to, you know, take some of the, the training methodologies and being able to put them that I've learned in the past of putting them 
in the right area on an annual training plan. And, you know, in the off season, of course, you got to go after them. You've got to, for lack of a better term, yes, you have to overstress them because you'll never get much of a change out of that. So, you know, taking what, what, what Cal has really taught me from the, the stress model and then saying, okay, we've got to really go after them and make sure we're, we're doing that on a, on a huge basis, but yet we still got to work movement technique, movement patterns, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of that stuff really impacts what I do, but then also at the same time being not being able to afraid to look at a training program and think, all right, is this working or is it not working? And if it's not working, pull one of those protocols out and just replace it, you know, with something else. And so again, it's constantly evaluating, you know, are we getting, are we chasing the right adaptation? Are we getting what we want out of this? Or is the athlete not responding to this certain training protocol? I love it. And then how are you trying to then determine whether these protocols are good, bad, or indifferent for each one of the kids? So again, just being able to, to look at, it. and again, as I, as I spoke before, yes, in the off season, if, if we're going after and trying to get an athlete actually stronger, just to actually be able, able to see, you know, we're not, we don't do a lot of with, with my teams, we don't do the one RM testing. Um, again, we have other ways of doing it, whether it's APRE, you know, a method like with that or being able to, you know, with, with the gym aware system is, are we able to, from a rate of force development perspective, move a heavier load at a given velocity? And so we're constantly monitoring, going through what they're doing as far as, you know, training protocol in the weight room on the fitness side of it. Yes, we have our, our, uh, fitness assessments with soccer and lacrosse and basketball, but the more technology that we get, you know, we're fortunate enough to have our, our catapult system here, our polar heart rate system. So again, always tracking as much data as we possibly can to see, you know, really where they actually at and then tying that information in with our, with our assessments in the weight room, with our, you know, our, our power output, et cetera, et cetera. And then just making the best decisions forward. I love that because I think that one thing that's really neat to me is how people can then combine all those things to drive training decisions. So how Big then time. working with your coaching staffs, does that tracking and monitoring through practice, not just impact what you do in the weight room, but impact what yeah. you're doing on the court or field? You know, it, it's huge. And so again, with, with University of Denver, with us being a, you know, a mid-major, if you will, being able to have those resources first and foremost is, is huge to us. So we actually have the power with, you know, my women's soccer team um, and some of the other teams I work with to actually say, all right, well, here's the daily load. And for example, you know, uh, Mackenzie's got a high load today. We've got to watch the training volume and practice. We may have to actually pull her, you know, give her an extra day of rest. And so we actually have the power to do that. But it's also just through communication and educating our coaches on, all right, when, when we're planning practice, you know, what, what is your practice plan look like? And, you know, Hey, we might want to kind of back things off just a little bit, or, um, you might have to, you know, reduce the reps on, on again, Mackenzie, if she's a little bit overstressed with some things. And so we've got the power to actually do that. And our coaches want that information on a daily basis, which for us is extremely important because they value us as part of the practice planning protocol going ahead. So again, that's really important for us. <clears throat> I love it. So then let's get get you out of here on this then. So then what's next? How is this going to formulate further? How is this going to drive further? And where do you guys see this entire evolution that you have going on there in Denver yeah. going forward? You know, I think for, for us, it's just figuring out and diving into what does what does each, each athlete need when they walk into my door? Where have they been to keep pushing forward and how do we keep getting better? And you know, it's 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 we're trying to get as much data as we can. You know, I mentioned resources such as, you know, having the 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 VBT training, the catapult system, the heart rate system, but it's also looking at things such as HRV and and figuring out okay, where are they at on a daily basis? And keep driving and getting as much data on each athlete as I walk through our door and just keep progressing them month after month, year after year, and just keep moving in the right direction. And also it goes with lifestyle management. You know, with my teams, I sit down with them. We go through a whole lifestyle management PowerPoint, educate them on, you know, 
proper nutrition. We have the luxury, again, the resource of having a fueling station right in our weight room here at the University of Denver. So again, what foods do you need pre-practice, post-practice? You know, if you're low on fuel coming into a session in the morning, this is what you need to have. And then also just on factors such as, you know, being smart with your time over the weekend, keeping a consistent sleeping cycle. So again, I keep going back to it's all about them, but we have to be the ones to keep educating our, our student athletes moving forward. <clears throat> I love it, Gary. Now, where can people see more of what you're doing and what you're getting into up there? So, obviously, you can uh, you can find me at uh, on Instagram with uh, gbo uh, gbo underscore thirteen. That's the Instagram. Um, Facebook also available on there. Uh, email address: first name Gary Boros at du edu. Um, again, that's those are the easiest ways to contact me. But any questions, I'd, I'd love to answer anything moving forward. That's for sure. <clears throat> I love it, Gary. I can't thank you enough for your time, man. This is absolutely killer. and uh, People are going to love this, buddy. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, brother. Well, thank you, and we'll be in touch real soon. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Jay. Yeah, man. And a huge thanks to Gary Boros for spending the time with us today. Guys, open, honest, candid sharing. A man literally sharing exactly what he's doing with his student-athletes at the present moment. Really don't know what more we could ask. Gary, thank you so much for being so open, honest, and candid today. I uh, truly appreciate everything you're doing, and keep up the great work down there, man. It, it's really showing, and, and really appreciate you taking the time and being so open and honest with your sharing today. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. As always, we're just trying to get the best information out there to all the coaches that we can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.